Max Hall and Melbourne Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. This is Nat Fife from the Fremantle Footy Club. Trent Cotchin from the Richmond Footy Club. Scott Benderbury from the Collingwood Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Patrick Cooch from the Carlton Footy Club. It's Rory Sloan here from the Adelaide Crows. This is Tom Mitchell from the Hawthorne Footy Club, and you're listening to the Coaches Panel. Hey friends, you got MJ from the Coaches Panel. We are nearly there at the top 10 of the 50 most relevant for 2021. Are you enjoying the episodes so far? Are you just getting into your preseason? Good news, there's almost 40 of them for you to go back and check out. Members of the panel and across the fantasy community all getting involved to discuss who I think are the most relevant players in 2021. If you disagree, that's totally okay. That's what this preseason is all about, as every preseason, starting the conversation. And if you agree, that's okay too. Backing in your data, backing in your research, looking at the players that we all think are relevant in 2021. Today, the champion of Dream Team last year, helping me talk about midfield Rory Led. I've got Rids back. Hello, mate. How are you? Hey, you going, MJ? I'm good, man. Look, pretty excited to talk about midfield Rory. A mid-season role change that we will no doubt get to in a second uh, has left people as they enter into 2021 ready to go. And Rids will go through the stats in just a moment, but he's that kind of guy that if he finishes of of last year, brings into what he does for 2021, boy, we've got ourselves a serious premium on our hands. It's crazy how many times we get to a preseason and we see people finishing the year before going crazy, and then suddenly they become the flavour of the month the next year. Yeah. You think about it. I mean, we could go way back to Rockcliffe. How many years ago was that now? You remember um, Rockcliffe was a forward at the yeah. time? And he had that massive end to the year and then suddenly – so, yeah, anyways, I'll let you get to your stats. And yes. The stuff, but you're 100% correct. It's All right. Last end. All right. Well, let's talk about this 27-year-old Adelaide Crows player. He is available in the defence and the midfield, important for us that he's got both of those opportunities. And last year, he had his best ever super coach score. It came as a 185 against the Collingwood Football Club. While in 2020, his highest score in AFL fantasy was a 139 in that same game. Crazy when you think about that. 139, limited quarters. Uh, do the math. That is well past 150. We're talking 160, 70. Like an absolute monster score for us last year. But still, not quite at his best ever score. To be honest, if you want to play the adjusted averages, it would have been. But we don't do that when it comes to individual scores. A 142 back in 2017 against the Giants was his best score that has been done in full-length games. He's delivered a seven a seasonal average of 79.9 in Dream Team and AFL Fantasy. If you want to play the adjusted averages, that's just shy of the 100 at 99.8, while Supercoach, it's a 105.1. In that format, he's going to be priced just over 564000 In AFL Fantasy, just over 760 k and just under 740000 in Dream Team. And, and Rids for years, pretty much the last four years, Across all formats of the game, maybe even five years, if you want to go back to the 2016 season when he kind of broke out and found his home in the Adelaide Crows back line. Rory Laird has just been a consistent, durable, reliable player for us across all formats of the game. It's crazy, isn't it? I remember about two or three years ago, we did a pod, um, maybe for the most relevant, Mm. and Rory Laird it was. And we actually came up with, his numbers, because of the years gone by, just he doesn't hurt you because his ceiling wasn't massive. Yeah. Um, I think we could actually change that after hearing those scores. Oh, man. He, he developed a ceiling about him. Now, there is a narrative and a reason for why. But, man, did he fly. When you look at that season in totality, it was pretty incredible. The Supercoach average last year of a 105, nine tons from those 17 games. Uh, of those tons, we'll talk about the role change in a sec, but seven of those nine tons came after the role change. Five of his hundreds were 120 plus, including that personal best score against the Magpies of 185. And then to go with that new developed ceiling, that continual high scoring basement floor was there. Just the three scores under 86 all year and nothing under 72. He ranked third for total points among all defenders for us in Supercoach last year and fourth by averages. But look, to be really pure about it, that's accurate. But Jeremy Howes in that top four, um, he only played four games. So in reality, 
he's in the top three of both. For Dream Team and Fantasy, that average of 79.9, an adjusted average of 99.8, three tons plus four additional scores, 80 plus. 80s in this format was the ton of 2020. He ranked second for defenders last year for total points and third for averages. Again, how's in that top three? But man, Rids, a slower start to the year than what we'd expected. But that middle to back end of the year, because of that role change, mate, he was along with Le- probably along with Jake Lloyd, the must have, and Luke McDonald, the must have informed defenders of the comp. Hundred percent, mate. Hundred percent and spot on. So we're going to have to do this a little bit different to the normal ones. We're going to right. probably have to split this guy into the formats. Now we say. We always say every format needs to be treated differently. Okay. We always harp and everything like that. Rory Laird is actually the reason why we say that, I suppose. It's very true. So, it's yeah. True. So, when we start breaking this down a little bit more, and I'm sure we will very, very shortly, yeah. we're going to have to talk Super Coach and then talk AFL Fantasy and talk Real Dream Team. Because the reality is, you could actually make positives and negatives for all three of them. Yeah. The other thing is a lot is going to actually depend on Adelaide, on how yes. they play, how they set up. Are they in rebuild? Are they not in rebuild? Like where does Led play? Is he going to go back to the future and go backwards or is he going to be in the midfield? And so on and so forth. So there's going to be an absolute intriguing discussion for the next 10 minutes, I reckon. It's going to be interesting because you talk about this midfield role change. It took place uh, against the North Melbourne Football Club when Adelaide was in that incredible funk of just not looking like they could get anything out of that core midfield group prior to this move he was averaging 69 in dream team and fantasy if you want to know what that is adjusted that's an 86 while it was in super coach an 80 uh was a 90 was what he was averaging pre this midfield move that reflects a little bit of what he did in 2019 uh, that year he had eight tons in dream team and fantasy um, a bunch of other scores between another eight scores between 90 and 99 um but a seasonal average uh, back in 2019 of a 96 yep top 10 defender no problem but certainly not heading into that elite territory where he's battling it out with midfielder super coach he averaged just shy of 97 that year across the year with a seasonal low of 73 and only two scores under 80 uh, but again eight tons three of them over 120 and additional scores between 90 and 99 the reason we bring this up is because after the move in super coach where before the buy He was averaging 90, not the buy, sorry, before the role change, it was 90. After the role change in Supercoach, 118. So we're seeing a guy that probably for the first half of 2021, of 2020, and all of 2019, Ritz, he's around that early 90s defensive marker. So it's a top 10, no question now, back lines. But with the role move, he now has put himself in the territory where he's one of only a few guys that might be able to compete with Jake Lloyd for that number one scoring spot. 100%. And I suppose it's as simple as this, isn't it? If he plays midfield, he is one of the first defenders you pick in super coach. Yeah. If he goes back to defense and he starts playing across half back and everything else, I don't think he's an absolute must have start. And I don't even know if he's a must have for all the season. Yeah. So I suppose. I know we're simplifying it, but it's sure. really nice. Let me read out these numbers, mate. 120, 185, 77, 120, 102, 122, 136, and 108. Wow. And that is in a team that was struggling to win football games. Correct. Now, I'm just going to throw another spanner in the works here. I don't know whether it's absolutely imperative if Adelaide need to win games this year. So mm. I don't know what the focus is. Is it to win games or is it to get another decent year of draft picks and recoup that rebuild to actually bounce a bit quicker? Yeah. So when we saw Laird go into the midfield, they actually started winning games of football. Yeah. Yeah, so he did. is it counterproductive if Laird plays in the midfield or does Matty Mix want Adelaide to actually win as many games as possible. So it's going to take a little bit of, um, and we only get one preseason game. So yeah. how, do, how do we know from that one preseason game? I've got no idea. 
but that should give us a real indication of the role. We don't it's care what he absolutely does. Absolutely, well, yeah. We don't care what he does. He doesn't. He doesn't have to have twenty-eight possessions or blah blah. Cut up or we any of that. No. Only role focused. Well, that's what it should be in every preseason game, isn't it, Rids? Is well, while the be. scores matter, it, it, it's what are we seeing in roles? And with just the one community series matchup, my, I suppose, assumption heading into that, and others might be different, but mine is I think teams are going to want to get as close to the best 22 available so that they at least get some synergy, chemistry, and opportunity to play together heading into round one within the next week or two. So that's kind of my biased presumption heading into there. And it's funny you talk about that Crows midfield lineup because Sloan and Crouch, while I think they're great ball winners, you know, Crouch really improved towards the back end of the year, some of his defensive efforts. But what led offered to that midfield unit that I still don't think they've been able to entirely fix with some of those draft selections is he's just so busy and dynamic and offers a burst of speed from stoppage. The, I don't think Crouch or Sloan or even some of the new draftees that they've brought in, let alone the kids they want to give opportunities to, really offer. So he does offer something there, even though they've got kids that need opportunities. But then you look at that half back line for the Crows. Again, we're talking about a team, they're not competing for finals this year, but they are competing for rebuilding as quickly as they can. There's guys like Hamill, McPherson, Brody Smith, who's certainly on, on the older side. Duday um, is coming off the back half as well. Miller are fit and firing. So it's not exactly if he has to move back to that half back because equally you can build a case, well, they need him in the back line, but they also need the kids to get developed opportunities equally through the midfield. They need him in the midfield, but they also need to give these new players a new opportunity. So it all depends on where Matty Nix believes the players will be best fitted. You know, yeah. like, Let's think of Scholl and let's think of how yeah. yeah. If he believes they're wingers and they're going to be wingers for the next 10 years of the Adelaide Football Club existence, mm. then the, he's just going to play them on the wing, isn't yeah. he? Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it makes no sense. So I don't actually think it's got anything to do with lead or anything with that in it's this argument. I yeah. think it's about everyone else. I so agree. I'm just going to play a little bit of devil's advocate on what you said earlier as well. Yeah. I believe with one preseason game, yes, the thought process should be it'd be the most um, locked in, you know, closest to round one and so on and so of forth. Of course. Except for teams in a rebuild. Yeah. Now, Good call. I actually believe that if they don't believe that, you know, the kids that they picked up, let's just use a couple of names in the draft net last year. Yep. They picked up Kedler. Yep. They picked up Berry. They yep. picked up Cook. Now, if they don't think they're going to be in the round one team, but want to give them a bit of exposure to see whether they're going to slide in in round three or four, mm. or be back up when someone gets injured, they may go down that path and actually not play their round one team. Yeah. No, it's a really, but, really good point. Yeah, so again, so there's a lot of dependencies here. And again, just because it happens in round one doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen in round five. There's every chance, like let's say um, Hamill comes in, he's started to run off halfback nicely. Yeah. Miller is doing a nice little impact. He's going to go into the midfield, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thought process. Brady Smith was in the midfield in the last year, year and yeah. a half. Well, there's no need to keep him in the midfield. We'll push him back and let the kid go into the midfield in Miller, who's shown absolute buckets, and let him go and get the exposure and get the experience in that position. It is absolutely intriguing. But let's I digress. Let's go back a step. Super coach, round one, he plays. He had his midfield role from last year in yep. the preseason game. You just have to start with it. Don't get the, cute. Just those numbers it. are like, well, I'm sure. Not. Let's be honest. Jake Lloyd's going to appear at some point in the last bit of the 50 most relevant. Like those numbers are alongside of Lloyd in terms of impact and ability. That's that's how good he really is. If, as you've mentioned, he maintains that midfield role for Super Coach. Yeah. So I, I sort of. I sort of put it along the same lines as a Dunkley, okay? Sure. You see Dunkley over the last couple of years coming, and I, and I know you're big on Dunkley this yes. year, so that's good. But again, I'm not going to talk you out of that. I'm just going to use that as an example. Sure. You've got a Trelaw coming in, 
And I think a lot of people have forgotten Stefan Martin comes in. Yeah, now, Dunkley was playing as a second ruck, which gave him the opportunity to be in the midfield a lot more over the last couple of years. So we saw a Toby McLean last year drop out of that midfield rotation with a Libertore. But it's the same sort of thought process. Bulldogs are up the ladder, so they're yeah. looking to compete and actually challenge. So they bring in experienced guys that may push or there might be too many mouths to feed in that midfield per se. And I could see why people don't want to start Buckley in that instance. Sure. Now, Adelaide's very similar principle, but, but a reverse. little bit in reverse. Yeah. They might want to give the kids to get 20 or 30 games exposure in these roles to actually improve them quicker to make sure they actually rebound and be finals competitive in the next three years rather than the next five years, if that makes sense. So that's basically just the way I'm explaining it now. So anyways, I think we've made our point with Supercoach. So we'll go over to AFL Fantasy. Yeah, that's fine. There's a couple of little interesting things here. Now, just in the last couple of days, we've 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 all been told about Whitfield. Um, Whitfield's bruised liver. There might be, you know, I don't even know what a bruised liver is. I thought a bruised liver was when you go out and you actually have too many drinks on a weekend. And that is another cause of it, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, or a boxing or UFC might get a bruised liver if someone kicks me in the liver. Like well, the reality is, I have no idea. Maybe a tackle or something. So this could be a three, four week. It could be a two week. It could be a two day thing. But yeah, Lockie hasn't had the greatest run with injuries. Let's be honest. And That's sometimes, true. sometimes they linger. So the absolute walk up star for that would be. Rory Laird, he's the obvious replacement, isn't he, in AFL yeah. Fantasy? So what you're doing is you're moving a round 12 by defender to a round 14 by defender, and it opens up a little bit of strategy through the buys where, and I know I'm not going to advocate doing sideways trades through buys and stuff, but AFL Fantasy, use them, lose them trades, that it really does open up the option. Yeah, you does. get the best of Laird in round 12 and 13, and then if you really, really feel like it, you can actually trade Laird to Whitfield and get Whitfield for round 40. Yeah. And lose absolutely nothing. So AFL Fantasy is going to come down to how many round 14 players you got yeah. and what's your strategy and what's your plan B if things go a little bit amiss. No, that's fair enough too. And then the format that you won last year, I'm intrigued on your thoughts about that. Again, you want these big end performing premiums for as long in the season as you possibly can. Rather than looking at just lead specifically in that format, I suppose I want to pose the question to you in this way. Can you start the big L3? Meaning Lloyd, Lockie, Whitfield, and Laird. Can you start all three? Now, if you ask for me personally, I would say no. I would say you need two out of the three, though. Okay, so why for you? And then let's give it a bit more generic, open-ended advice. Yep, so just from my thoughts, there's too much value in those defensive lines. And I don't think Whitfield and Leg will hurt you enough in the first 10 weeks based on what they've done in the past. Sure. But DT's also got a bigger picture where you look at completed teams and everything else. So to expect that you're going to upgrade and earn enough coin to be able to complete your teams and upgrade fully through the course of the year to have all three by round 12, round 13 is probably a little bit of an oversight. Like you still need to have your 12, 13 guys that you're happy to end the season with. So you've got a 30 trade period. You've got to come down, you know, often you need to do two downgrades to an yeah. upgrade at times, you know, you get a bit tight with a couple of injuries here and there and everything else. So I just don't think it quite meshes up to be all three starting because, like, what are we talking? If Lloyd goes absolutely bananas this year, I think we're all kidding ourselves if we think it's going to be more than 105, 110. Mm. We're looking at guys like Whitfield, what, 105? Yeah. And Laird at, say, 95. We're only looking at 300 points combined for a lot of investment. Now, yeah. you might be able to get, say, 240 by going three $80,000, um, 80-point 80 average players mm. with a lot more upside 
and then cash in by utilizing those dollars elsewhere. And you might have a Rory Atkins instead of a rookie on the field in the midfield. Or you might have a Z ball instead of a rookie or a Heppel. You know, there's a whole heap of things you can actually play around with. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can kind of get there. I suppose for people that want to start with Rory, whether it be in Dream Team or any of the other formats, yes, there is huge potential upside that the way we saw him end the year is exactly how his trajectory into 2021 and beyond absolutely is. But what you need to do is it's a risk versus reward selection with anybody that's got an element of potential role movement. Now, I'm probably more of the belief that I think I've seen enough of what he adds to the Adelaide midfield. I think he's going to teach some good habits to them. I think he's going to get plenty of time. Now, will he be exclusive? I think with the longer quarters, probably not as much, but I still think he's going to get plenty of midfield time through there. But here's the, not the warning, the caveat for you. Are you prepared to get his downside as a worst case scenario? And that downside is that 90 defender. That's what he's really kind of delivered for us the past year and a half pre the role change. And if for you, you can, great. If not, then maybe you need to reconsider that move. So I'm going to throw a little bit of a different thought process out. If you think his downside is 90 and his upside's 100, I would actually say to people to have a little bit of a um, different thought process here Mm. and think through who can I select on any line? And this is the important thing here. For a starting team, you can actually, you can compare defender with forward or defender with, you know, because there's just, it's a starting team. There's no trades. So you can actually go, well, Matty Rao, who was just a couple of days ago, is 580,000 in Dream Team or 500, 570 something thousand. Yeah. We're talking about Rory Laird at 738, which is 150,000. Why wouldn't people be comparing one to the other and seeing what they could do with that 150 to add points, you yeah. know, in the other position? So, Let's just say if you don't have Miller at the moment and you've got, uh, who's the two? Let's say um, Denver Granger Brass for Hawthorne sure. in the back line at this point in time. And you've got Rory Laird in there. So why not think about going Laird out, Denver up, okay, with mm-hmm. the 150000 to get Miller up and then bring Rowell into the midfield, you know? for a Rory Laird type scenario where you can actually move the buckets just as long as you've got enough rookies and mid prices and stuff to fill the gaps. But people need to look at, start looking at things as a combination rather than a a one for one relationship. So, and this is, I saw that you did a beautiful post on um, the CP page on Facebook and Twitter the other day, where it says Dunkley versus Walsh versus Camilio versus Taranto, who's going to average more. Yeah. It's such an intriguing question, isn't it? Because if you add 160,000 rookie to those options, so let's say Walsh plus a forward 160,000 versus um, Dunkley and a midfield 160,000, then it really becomes, wow, you can actually chop and choose and everything else, yeah, especially yeah. if that forward is likely to average 60, 70, to, you know, Who knows, you know, we're only just talking about a Ned Cahill the other day about potentially having a defensive role. You know, we've seen it before, haven't we, where rookies just appear from nowhere where they go on a different um, role than what they have previously and go on four, five-week binges of 70-point averages. Yeah, well, that's ultimately the thing, isn't it? Yeah, and that ultimately determines, well, Rory's not a, a... Uh, mid price or a stepping stone pick uh, as a premium option what it does do which you're talking about is these cows whether they do or don't come through is going to inform some of the strategy about how much necessity moves us to needing more mid price options or stepping stone options for coaches so yeah i'm i'm really fascinated to get people to think outside of the box outside of just a one defensive line and go well Laird versus Chris, who scores more? Well, it's not just about that. You've got to look at the price points. You've got to look at your side in totality overall. And then based off that, your own research and just the players you like owning, pick who you want to start with and then adjust as you go. Look, at the end of the day, if Rory's not in your starting squad, you're going to be tracking the rest of his season as a legitimate upgrade target because he's going to be there and thereabouts for us. 
And whether that midfield time comes or doesn't, will ultimately determine what you do. All right. Uh, where the other thing with that, so MJ, yeah. just quick one. Just another thing with that is, though, you get more data this longer the season goes as well. So you don't have to rectify a mistake of starting when they're not going as well or got the yeah. role. You could actually get more data and you can act on it at any point in time. You got trades through the season and you don't do. be scared to fix something that you missed. No, you that's know, exactly what right. do we always say in the first two or three rounds? We should always be used, you know, plenty to use at least two or three trades to rectify something that we've missed. Yeah, no, otherwise it, it could ruin your season. Now, I just want to throw another spanner in the works here. I know that we're going over time, but I do apologize to everyone on the kids. <laughs> the reality is, I look at Rory Laird off the back line, and I think he is very, very similar to Dustin Martin of the forward line. Mm. So, both. We'll probably go 90s at very worst. Yes. Okay. Um, both are potential to go into midfield and do this and do that and everything else. The thing is, though, what is their upside? Now, we've seen Laird. I think Laird goes to about 100 upside if he goes into the midfield. We know Dusty can get to 105, 110 if he has that. Yeah. So they are the sort of challenges you have. Plus, then you incorporate that Dusty's $50,000 less. So that's where you come up with those jiggles and working out how do I save 50000 to get that guy I really, really want in the midfield and so on and so forth. So that's, that's just the thought process anyway. No, I like it, man. All right. In terms of a draft, we are seeing uh, at our friends, the Draft Doctors mock site, uh, which you should definitely go and check out for your single seasonal drafts. Uh, we're seeing defenders, especially the top tier and forwards, the top tier going at a premium. So I think he's largely going, no doubt, as a D1, but he's going as early as a late first round. And I'm barely seeing him last much into the second round. Rids, would you jump with a first round selection with him or would you rather try to get him on the turn into the second? So MJ, you know I do things a little bit more different than most. Yes, I do. I would split the first round in half. Yeah. Okay. So if you've got 10 teams, I would split it in half. First five picks, second five picks. Yeah. Now, if in the first round, if you have the first five picks, I believe, and I'm absolutely adamant on this, you're either looking for a ruck yes, or the best of the best on any line, okay? Correct. Yeah, absolutely. If you think, and it doesn't matter who the name is, no. if you think it's side bottom in the forward line and you think he's a clear or you think it's Lloyd in the back line, absolutely. Now, if you're get six to 10, I think that means you ignore the rucks because, again, I'm saying the rucks because there's Gorn, Grundy and O'Brien, mm. and then you've got Marshall with that DPP. There's there's probably a tier of four there at the moment that are looking absolutely crazy, you know, and yeah. they're potentially going to go early, early, early anyway. Yeah. But if you've got six through to 10, and then you flip back through the other way, you'll get that pick, you know, in the early teens or whatever. You could potentially get, let's just say, the best forward and the best defender. Yeah. in those two picks. And that could very well be Laird. So I 100% agree that Laird needs to be around that discussion, but it all depends on where you sit in the first round rather yeah. than saying first round. Yeah. So okay. I think it's either at the back and hope he slides into the second round early. Mm -hmm. And that if there's someone better, you take him. If there's no one better, he goes on those middle or second stages of the first round. Yeah, it's on the turn either side of it. All right, man, appreciate your thoughts as we've talked about Rory Laird. Easy, buddy. Uh, if you want to go check out the article, it is online now for you at coachespanel.tv. All the other players we've revealed so far, their articles and podcast episodes are there too. Well, one more player to go before we hit the top 10. Who is it? I'll tell you this. They finished in the top 10 last year, but they don't this year. We'll tell you about them tomorrow. Oh,